The year is 2018. During this time, many now iconic series were starting to make their debut onto Shonen Jump. Out of the many releases, two stories would go on to make names for themselves as they explored new ideas and themes. Blue Lock focused on a more selfish style of playing, emphasizing individuality over teamwork. Chainsaw Man, on the other hand, chose to tell a more mature and dark story, discussing themes and ideas that appeal to an older demographic. These stories were very different from the typical stories that Shonen Jump has produced, and as time went on, they became overwhelmingly popular. This video, however, isn't focused on these two series. The one that I plan to talk about is another series that came out that same year and has become one of Shonen Jump's most popular franchise. This video aims to look back on the series and what it meant to me now that the series is ending this month. The one that I want to talk about is... Written by JJ Akutami, the series initially released on Jump Giga in 2017 under the name Tokyo Metropolitan Cursed Technical School, or as some of you might know as Jujutsu Kaisen Zero. The story followed a different protagonist from the main series, but the premise was still the same. A group of teenagers attending a school that teaches them how to exercise curses. The manga had a decent amount of sales during its first week, and it helped to introduce a lot of the core characters that we would meet in the main series. Once the manga was done, JJ never really planned to publish the series onto Weekly Shonen Jump, but changed his mind after the positive reception of the series. A year later, on March 5th, 2018, Jujutsu Kaisen was published on Weekly Shonen Jump, and since its release, it has shook the manga industry. In 2019, a year after its release, the series has sold over a million copies and has become Shonen Jump's best-selling manga, beating top series such as One Piece, My Hero Academia, and Demon Slayer. But what makes it so special? The beginning chapters of JJK are very normal. Yuji is introduced as a typical shonen protagonist who does good deeds and is physically stronger than his peers. He gets sucked into the world of curses and has to overcome many obstacles along the way. What makes the story unique is how it subverts our expectations. One of the most notable examples early on is the inner demon trope that the series uses. We're meant to assume that Sukuna is going to help Yuji as this is how the trope usually goes. In episode 12 of the anime, Yuji asks Sukuna to help him heal his friend Junpei as he's turned into a curse and he believes that he'll help him just as he did before. Instead, he refuses. Sukuna doesn't want to help Yuji, in fact he loves seeing him suffer, mocking him for not being able to do anything for Junpei. His cruelty is put on full display in this scene and it's so chilling seeing the inner demon be an actual demon. It's at this point that we as readers realize that this story isn't going to turn out as we think it will and that's what makes it so interesting. It makes sense that Sugina wouldn't help Yuji, because why would he? He's a demon that's known as the strongest in history and has been doing whatever he wants for years. He doesn't emphasize with humans or feel any attachment to them. He's a curse through and through, and the scene of him and Mahito just laughing at Yuji was unsettling. Yuji is about to lose his friend and these two are enjoying his suffering. What makes it even better is that Yuji tells Mahito that he's going to kill him, and in most shonens, they don't really kill the villain. They mostly capture or knock them out. Here, however, he actually does plan to kill him, as even Mahito tries to correct him in a mocking tone. There's another moment where our expectations are subverted, but I want to save that for later since it's part of a larger section of the video and there's still more that I want to talk about. It's no exaggeration when I say that every character in JJK is amazing. Every character is extremely popular and their fans are a little unhinged to say the least. If you don't believe me, just open TikTok and type in any JJJ character and 9 out of 10 times, they're thirsting for them. You guys seriously need some help. One of the best things about JJ's writing is just how he's able to make characters hold their own in the story. Everyone has their own goals and complex personalities that don't need the main character to bounce off of. Megumi isn't Yuji's rival. He joins Jujutsu High in order to save his sister from a curse and acts more as a friend to Yuji. Nover isn't a love interest that's used to prop up Yuji. Her only reason for joining is because she hated the countryside and wanted to get away from it. It's a selfish desire, yes, but it's better than having the same goals as the main character. Everyone in the series is given the same treatment as they all have individual goals for joining Jujutsu High, and it just so happens that Yuji is there for the journey. This is also why a lot of people say that Yuji isn't the main character of his own show, but I argue that he still is because of how normal he is. He's a kid that's been thrown into an unknown world and is learning it at a reasonable pace. For the purpose of this video, I want to highlight two of my personal favorite characters as I believe they help to highlight JJ's writing. Toto is a charming character as he serves as Yuji's alleged best friend. In his introduction, we get a sense that he's a himbo type character as he asks Megumi what type of woman he likes and then proceeds to fight him as he finds his answer really boring. With Yuji, he senses a kinship with him since his answers align with his and this creates some sort of resonance with him, even going as far as to create fake shoujo memories of the two going to middle school together. I don't even need to explain just how hilarious this is. 
Behind us though, he still has layers to him as he teaches Yuji how to use the Black Flash and is able to make smart decisions in a fight. He is a hard character for me to hate. There is a good amount of depth to him and I love his relationship with Yuji, allegedly, as well as his love for idols. I am personally not a fan of them myself, but I respect how passionate he is about them. Maki is a favorite of mine because of how strong and cool she is. Her backstory is that she left her family because of the horrible abuse and treatment she received for being a woman and for her inability to use curse techniques. However, in exchange, she was gifted with immense physical power and is able to hold her own against curses and other people. Her goal in the story is to be the strongest sorcerer ever and become the head of her family as a way to spite them for all the years of mistreatment. Maki is just the best. She has a compelling story and is able to fight against sorcerers her own age because of how physically strong she is. She feels like a true shonen protagonist with the way she's written and I love it. But while these two are some of my favorite characters, they aren't exactly my number one. That spot goes to the main character himself. Yuji Itadori had replaced Yuka Okatsu as the main character and his design was taken from Inumaki Toge, one of the characters from Zero. When comparing the two, Yuji is a lot more extroverted and carefree as opposed to Yuta's introverted and timid nature. He fits the standard positive and strong protagonist role that we've all been accustomed to, especially with how he also has a dead guardian like everybody else. Does Japan have a massive orphan problem? I feel like we should be concerned with how many dead parents there are. As the series went on, I found that Yuji as a main character felt very different. He's not the strongest, doesn't have a tragic backstory or any sort of selfish desire. He only wants to save people and to have a good death. While this is a noble goal, it wasn't born from his own desire. Instead, it was born from his grandfather's dying wish. You take this away, and you realize that Yuji doesn't have any desire or wish of his own. His reason for saving others is because it was a task given to him, and it's why he puts himself in danger constantly. He dehumanizes himself, thinking that this is his role in the bigger scheme. His journey is about breaking free from this mentality and finding his own self-worth. He's my favorite character because of how I see myself in him. When I was a kid, I had no goals or aspirations. I didn't value my own self-worth and only did what the adults in my life told me to do because I believed that it would give me my purpose. Now that I'm a bit older, I know what direction I want with my life and honestly, it's terrifying. I don't know what's going to happen and I'm afraid of failing, but I keep going because I know there are people in my life that will be there to help me. At this time, Yuji hasn't realized this yet and still has more challenges ahead of him. This next section is where his limits are truly pushed. The main plot of the arc was that the villains have joined forces in order to seal off Gojo. It's during this arc that we see just how much JJK strays from the norm. The first major instance was the removal of Gojo from the story. Gojo acted as a safety net for the others because of how he could handle any threat that they couldn't beat by themselves. By removing him, this adds a new level of stress and anxiety for the characters. And as readers, we don't know who's going to die. Fights have higher stakes to them and are some of the best ones in the series. I was on the edge of my seat watching these fights because they were some of the coolest, most visually appealing fights that I've ever seen. The most notable ones being the return of Toji in his fight with Dragon and Megumi, Choso vs Yuji because of how visually and audibly amazing it was, and Gojo's fight against the curses because, well, it's Gojo. Anytime he's fighting someone, it's just a 10 out of 10. But out of all these moments, the one that truly stole the show for me was when Sukuna entered the scene. His fight with Maharaga is brutal. The two of them are zipping through the city, destroying everything in their way and using whatever part of the city they can grab to beat each other. While all this is going on, the art style is constantly changing and it's just so f cool. When he summons his domain expansion, it's just pure chaos as the narrator is just explaining his domain expansion in a calm voice and the music is just popping off. Everything evaporates in his wake and at the end of the fight, part of Shibuya becomes an endless wasteland. Once he's done, he lets Yuji have control back just to let him suffer. He breaks down remembering everything that Sukuna did and starts scratching the ground till his hands bleed, telling himself to die. He blames himself for not stopping Sukuna from taking over and he sees it as if he killed all those people. This scene was chilling and I would have enjoyed it a lot more if the music didn't start playing. The audio of him breathing and scratching the ground helped add on to the tension and I think the rest of it should have been ambience instead of a song. Playing specials during a traumatic event like this really killed a lot of the tension that it built up. My nitpicks aside, the next scenes truly bring him down because afterwards, he witnesses the death of both his teacher and his friend once again at the hands of Mahito. This man truly is the most hated character in all of JJK, with how much damage he's done to Yuji and to the community as a whole. Yuji had reached his limit a while ago, but this was the tipping point. To add insult to the wound, Mahito doesn't even give him a second to process their deaths and begins to beat him in both the physical and psychological sense. This is war, not a battle to fix what's wrong, but a clash of truths. You are me, Yuji Itadori. 
I killed without a second thought, just like you save people without a second thought. It's a battle to determine who will be left standing in the 100 years. How the hell did you think you were going to beat me when you don't even realize that? Tell me, Yuji Itadori, have you ever stopped to count how many curses you've killed? This speech to Yuji is peak writing as there was nothing wrong with what he said. Mahito doesn't need a purpose to kill humans and he calls out Yuji for being naive for not accepting it. The anime does a good job with this scene as the music is just dead silent and all you can hear is just Mahito screaming at Yuji while violently tossing him around like a ragdoll. With no will to fight, he lays there, ready to die at the hands of Mahito, but is saved at the last moment by Toto. He tells Yuji to fight with him, but as we've already established, Yuji has given up completely. Seeing this, he tries to get through to him with these words. Brother, you're a man amongst men. Don't limit yourself to such narrow-mindedness. We are Jujutsu sorcerers. Our friends who have passed away will not truly have been defeated. Looking for meaning or logic in death can at times defile the memories of those we've lost. Even so, what have you been trusted with? Toto really is the bro that we all need in life and this moment highlights why he's one of my favorite characters. With a renewed sense of purpose, Yuji stands against Mahito with Toto and is given his just desserts. His defeat was so satisfying because of how evil he was throughout the whole series and if a villain is able to make you hate him this much, then he's done his job. Looking at the defeated Mahito, Yuji finally accepts that they are both the same. He no longer cares about why curses do what they do anymore and will kill them because he can. He tells him that he will continue to hunt him down even if he changes himself and will continue to do it for as long as he lives. It ends with Mahito running away and Yuji chasing him like a wolf, hunting his prey. So what happens next? The beginning of Jujutsu Kaisen was perfect. The action, the writing, the characters, everything blended so well together that everything that I've talked about doesn't even scratch the surface of just how well written this series truly is. If there was any part that I left out, it's mostly because I didn't know how to describe it well enough or it started to match up with another section of the video. Jujutsu Kaisen perfectly highlights JJ's strengths as it shows off tropes and ideas that Shonen has never tried before. When rewatching the series and rereading the manga, it was like walking back in time. You see, I stopped reading the manga around the end of the Shibuya arc and never really continued it. Not because I didn't like it, I was just busy with work and school at the time. I just recently caught up to the manga this month and my experience of it was like revisiting an old friend. This video only covered the first half of the series since the last chapter hasn't come out yet and I wanted to wait for it so that I could form an opinion on the series as a whole. Believe me, I have a lot to say for the second half. Whether or not the ending changes my outlook on the series, we'll just have to wait and see. Until then guys, stay safe, stay healthy, and keep on reading.